Hi, that's okay. Okay. Um, so good. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to start um, introductions for today's talk. So today we have um, Megan Valentine, who's going to give first a um, tutorial talk aimed at students. Although, of course, everyone's welcome to listen. I think it'll be educational for me also on soft matter mechanics. Um, and then after a five minute for uh, Q and A. A research talk on reverse engineering nature, applying biological strategies to material design. Um, and during the tutorial talk, we have a request for you. Um, we ask that students sort of turn on your video um, so Megan can kind of see who the people who are here, um, who, who will be sort of the main audience. Um, and for professors, turn video off. That will drop us down in the list um, and make the students more visible. And then our usual requests, we like that um, we ask that you use your full name in Zoom so we know who you are and who's asking questions. During the talk, please go ahead and mute yourself. Um, if you have questions, put them in the chat box. Um, and if they're clarifying questions or kind of um, also questions during the tutorial, um, the moderators will go ahead and ask them. Um, during the uh, question and answer after the talk, which, uh, and after each talk, you can also unmute and ask questions verbally. And um, after uh, both talks are finished, so just about an hour from now, there'll be an additional 15 minute informal discussion. If you'd like to join for that, you're welcome. And just to make sure people are aware, the talk is also being recorded. Um, good. All right, so I will stop sharing here and um, we'll have Megan go ahead and get start sharing and get started. All right. Does that work? It is displaying. Yep. It's not in presenter mode yet. Yep. I'm getting there. Yep. How's that? That looks good. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks for the invitation. I am, uh, I'm really excited to have a chance to, um, to share some of our research in the second half of the talk and then also to share some of what I've learned um, during my time in a mechanical engineering department to think about how uh, engineers think about mechanics, which I think is a little bit different than the way uh, physicists think about mechanics. So, so my background is all in physics, right? All my formal degrees are in physics and, and kind of biophysics and soft matter physics. But, um, but all of my faculty career has been in a mechanical engineering department at, at UC Santa Barbara. And I think it's given me a really different perspective on how to consider uh, the mechanics of soft materials and how to approach biomechanics questions and soft matter physics questions. And uh, so I wanted to spend some time in the tutorial uh, building that type of vocabulary for you and sort of thinking about like, how do engineers approach these, these questions and, uh, and what can we learn from that in, in, terms of, in terms of research? So here's some examples of typical types of um, soft materials, right? That we might encounter in everyday life. So these are our hydrogels or polymers, cells and tissues. And um, I think the, the, the interesting piece of this is that we often interact with these without thinking about their design or their mechanics very much at all, right? Now, of course, like some materials we kind of play with, like Jello, right? So food engineering and food mechanics is actually like this really interesting field, and I almost went into it at some point. So, so food is a really interesting example of soft materials, but then we see them in contact lenses. Of course, soft materials are in our bodies in terms of cartilage, in terms of heart tissue. Um, any types of tissue, right? So uh, you can also design and engineer soft materials for um, for engineering purposes and biomedical purposes. So here's an example of an injectable hydrogel. Um, in this case, we're using this for cell sensing. So this is a small hydrogel. Cells can grab around that hydrogel, deflect it. If we know the materials properties, we can use that for force sensing. But you can also use these types of materials to um, deliver drugs or to deliver other sorts of um, therapeutic agents into cellular tissues. So, so our ability to be able to design and control these types of materials is really useful both to understand, you know, the underlying mechanics of, of natural tissues and then also to draw inspiration from that to, to create artificial tissues. And that's, that's what we'll talk about in the second part of the talk. But for now, I wanted to give you like a little overview of the way I see my contributions to research and like the way I kind of see my, my fairly diverse portfolio of, of work, which is, which, which partly I guess shows the, um, you know, my, my inability to focus down on any one thing for too long and, and my interest in kind of spreading, spreading out 
uh, and learning lots of new things all the time. So, so uh, in terms of biological systems, my lab has spanned length scales from proteins to organisms. I'm going to focus more on this later. Um, but, but the input here is, you know, experiment, tooling, we use computation and theory, although typically in collaboration with others. So the, the, the core part of my lab is an experiment and the outcomes of, of these studies of these natural systems is both a fundamental knowledge of the biology and the, and the biophysics, but increasingly translating that into engineering products for, for healthcare and packaging and robotics. Okay, so if we think about like words we use to describe mechanical systems, right? So just take a moment and think about like what words would you, you use to describe like a material and you wanted to describe the mechanics of that material. So, so I think there's lots of different words that we can use. Here's like a little jumble that I came up with, right? So stiff or tough or strong or resilient or extensible or elastic. And all of these words have like very specific engineering meaning and we tend to use them, especially in the physics community, um, a little sloppy sometimes. So I thought, uh, in the tutorial, I would give you some background in what all these words mean and how we can measure them and how we can kind of extract that information and then use that uh, for design of materials in research. So, so if we start with these macroscopic properties, um, solids are often modeled using springs. And I'm going to focus mostly today on soft solids. So of course, viscoelastic materials and time dependent materials are very interesting and there's lots of soft materials that fall into that category, but I'm going to focus more on the solid mechanics piece of it uh, this time. So if we apply a force by Hooke's law, we know that we get an extension and there's a spring constant that relates those two. Uh, if we plot force versus extension, it's linear. The slope gives us the stiffness. And if we look at these functions as a period, as a function of time, if we look at these variables as a function of time, um, there's a linear relationship between force and extension. Uh, the, the difference between them here, I'll try to put on my pointer. Uh, the difference between them here is the ratio of the force to the stiffness and elastic responses are time independent, right? So that's, that's all things that we're very familiar with. Um, the regime over which this holds is called the elastic regime. And in this regime, the deformation is recoverable. So that means that if I like stretch a spring and release it and stretch it again, I get the exact same stiffness and I get the exact same energy back. That's the kind of the nature of a spring, right? So, so that's how we'll define elasticity. Um, and these small displacements are typically happening uh, in, the, in the elastic regimes. So this happens at very small displacements for typical types of materials. And stiffness is a great way to define what a material is. It's like that relationship between force and displacement. But the, uh, the challenge is that the value of the stiffness depends not only on the materials property, but also on the geometry. And you can see that here through the little picture that shows uh, you know, uh, aluminum in this case that has been extruded into different shapes. So, so we have an I-beam, which is very stiff, would be very hard to bend. But then you also have a rod, which you kind of, you know, intrinsically know would be a little bit easier to bend, right? And these are made of the same material, but the different, the different structures give rise to, um, to different types of uh, stiffness responses. So to get around this, we define instead a different property called modulus, where here if we had a, a, a beam, say, uh, which had a length L and a cross-sectional area A, and I apply a tensile load onto this face, and I extend it by some amount delta L, uh, then I can define uh, a stress, which is that force per unit area, and say that that's related to the strain, which is the uh, difference in, in, in length, and the scaling parameter here is E, which is a modulus. So, so stress and strain are related in this way. Remember, Hooke's law told us that the um, stiffness was force divided by extension. If we reorganize the terms, we can find the stiffness here is related to E, uh, which is the Young's modulus, um, and, and this geometric factor. And, and by, by kind of placing things in this light, in terms of stress and strain, rather than in terms of um, stiffness and force and displacement, then, then E becomes a property purely of the material. And, and we can pull out the geometric terms, right? So and this geometric ratio actually depends very specifically on the type of geometry we have here. If we looked at like a bending modulus, for instance, we would have a very different geometric term, but the materials properties would always be captured by E. So, so, e is the, so this is the stiffness of the rod and the tension, and E is the Young's modulus. So it's a constant of proportionality between stress and strain in the linear limit. Okay, and, and Young's modulus typically defines tensile loading. So if you're, if you're pulling something in tension, um, but it can also be used sometimes to, you can also sometimes measure it in compression, although usually the compression modulus is different. Um, so in, in thinking about modulus, the simplest form, we think about materials that are homogeneous and isotropic, right? So they have uniform materials throughout and those materials properties do not depend on the direction. So 
Uh, there are different types of moduli depending upon the different type of loading that you give. So here's an example of a shear modulus. So in a shear modulus, you have, you know, you apply a shear. So you hold one plate constant at the bottom and you apply a shear force to the top. Um, this rotates the sample through some angle and now you have that axis strain effectively. So now you have stress versus strain. Um, and the constant of proportionality is another modulus, but it's called the shear modulus. It's related to the elastic modulus through the Poisson ratio, which is the ratio of transverse to axial strain. So typically as you like pull something, it tends to thin in the opposite direction. So the Poisson ratio tells you about that, that relationship. In most soft materials, the Poisson ratio is between like 0.2 and 0.5. So, um, so if you have anisotropy, it's much harder, right? An example of this is a lattice structure. This is one of my favorite lattice structures which is the Eiffel Tower. Um, but the uh, but lattice structures are, are, are more complicated, right? Because the, the response of the structure really depends upon the loading geometry that you have with respect to the sample geometry, right? So, so for instance, lattice structures might be really good in, in tension, but buckle in compression or, or shear because the, the joints that hold the, the two struts together tend to fail and tend to kind of collapse the structure. So, so um, this is not an isotropic or homogeneous structure, and and they're they're harder to they're harder to analyze, but um, but it's possible to analyze those systems as well. Okay, so so how do you measure this, right? So um, in in biomechanics and cell mechanics in particular, we are often measuring properties um, at the micro scale, but but most of these properties and most of these concepts were developed in engineered materials and the the kind of formalism we have for measurement was was done with engineered materials that are available you know abundantly and in very large quantities so the typical experiments that would be used to measure these properties uh, would be like an instron system and i borrowed this image from um, from a lab at, at umbc and here is an instron machine and you have a, a specimen which would go in and this top here is called the, the crosshead. The crosshead would move up and then you measure force, right? So the, 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 um, the uh, size of this specimen can vary, but it's going to be like at least centimeter probably, right? So, so for jello, for hydrogels, for, um, for bone samples, for tissue samples, this is a possibility. It's not a possibility for individual measurements of cells. That's a microscale measurement, right? But, um, but for these kind of macroscale measurements, we can do it. Some challenges for soft materials, clamping is super difficult, right? So clamping is like a real challenge in these cases because it is difficult to uh, be able to apply enough normal load that you can hold the sample without tearing it. So tearing samples is a, is a significant problem. Um, also in these systems, you, you typically wanna come up with like standard sample shapes and tests so that you can, um, you can control the deformation across the sample. So this again gets to the question of how, um, I guess how uniform the stress is across your, your system and how, how well you're able to compare, uh, compare your data. So there are standard samples for this. Visualization is a huge plus, okay, in these systems. So <clears throat> here's an example of a material that's being stretched. Um, first, I just want you to see the, material, the system and then I'll tell you a little bit about the material. So here is that crosshead, which is this black brick being moved and being pulled to, um, to the right, I guess, in this case. And now you see the sample, which is being torn. And as this is going through, you can measure the force, right? And in this case, I'm, I'm showing you the visualization and you're able to see the stretch of the sample and to see this sort of um, pulling apart. This is a material that we 3D printed using a, um, a 3D printing technology that allows for multi-material printing. Um, and, and we recently published this and I'm not gonna get into the details of that in this uh, tutorial. But, um, but I did wanna show you what it looks like when these things pull apart and, um, and to give you an idea of how complicated tearing can be and fracture can be. Okay. Sorry, so if we Megan, think about, Megan, can you just yeah. say briefly that thing you 3D printed, what's it made of? It's made of two different types of polymers, one that is um, one that's stiffer than the other. So the inside is a, uh, is a soft, a slightly softer material and the outside is a, is a harder material. But, um, but I can refer you to the paper for the specific chemistries of it, but it's, it's, uh, it's two different types of polymers with slightly different moduli and very different uh, strains to failure. Okay, so, um, so let's dig a little bit deeper into what this means, right? So those are kind of like general, general descriptions and general terminology. So if we think about modulus, um, here we have modulus is stressed by strain, right? That was that proportionality constant. 
And this is true, um, I guess for Young's modulus, this is true in the linear regime. And if we look at the units of this, we would have, um, strain is dimensionless, so we have units of stress, which is pressure or uh, force per area. And we can also write this as energy per volume, right? So the moduli really represent an energy density in this regard. Um, and we can think about what that energy density would be. So for a typical hard material, uh, the, you know, and this is just a very crude scaling, but for a typical hard material, the energies that are involved are typically like electron volt energies, right? That's, that's sort of the, the scale that you would consider. And the volume, you know, the, the length scales that are associated with typical hard materials like ceramics or metals um, is small. So, so let's say less than half a nanometer, I, I kind of rough guessed here. So with that, if we look at like, what's the energy density in the material, like what's the energy that it would take to deform that material with this amount of energy over this length scale, you know, it's gigapascals basically. And that's, that makes sense, right? Because they're, they're very stiff, very tough material, very hard materials. Um, for the typical soft material, on the other hand, the energy scale is usually not electron volts, it's usually thermal energy. So thermal energy is the scale that's setting um, how, much, how much energy we have in the system, and then the volume is typically operating over much larger length scales. So on polymer networks, polymers are larger, we have entanglements, we have um, protein structures that are much larger than, than a few angstroms, and we end up with... Uh, with a much larger length scale here in the denominator. And since it's a volume, so it's cubed, that creates a huge effect in terms of the stored energy within that volume. Uh, so, so you can typically get soft materials that are in the range of Pascals rather than gigapascals. And it's, that, it's really the length scale that drives it more than the difference in energy. But, um, but when you think about, you know, why are some materials so soft and why are some materials so hard? Like typically it has to do with like the length scales over which they're deforming and the energies that are at play in, 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 in resisting that deformation. Okay, so uh, we can rewrite Hooke's law now instead of writing it as force versus displacement as stress versus strain. And in the, in, for small displacements, that linear regime, the slope is the Young's modulus, right? Modulus has units of Newton's per meter squared. This, is, this linear regime is called the elastic regime. It's typically limited to small strains. And in fact, if we ask the question like, well, what makes it small? Like we define small as the range in which this linear relationship holds, okay? So for materials like small, small strain mechanics are mechanics where you have a Hooke's law type of response. And recall that in this elastic regime, the deformation energy is recoverable. So if I stretch in the elastic regime and I unload and then I stretch again, I should get the same response, right? All of the energy that, that is in the system can be, can be recovered. We call this a reversible system. All right, so what happens at large strains? And the, the typical, <laughs> the best answer is like, well, it depends. It depends a lot on what material you have, but let's look at kind of a typical case, right? So for a typical case, you would have stress as a function of strain you would have a linear regime, which is the small strain regime where you have an elastic response and then something else happens, right? And, and here we call this the nonlinear regime. And there are many ways to be nonlinear, but a typical way is, for, um, is, is, is to end up with a kind of a plateau here that maybe eventually pops back up into a, into a linear regime. So if we, um, if we just specify that, the small strains would be the elastic regime. This is where you have a Young's modulus. Uh, a plateau regime where we talk about yield, where this is where the sample begins to accumulate damage, uh, and then often a second linear regime. And, and in, this, in this lecture, I'm not gonna get into the details of, of why this is a very common type of stress-strain relationship for biomaterials, but, but you might imagine that in a lot of biomaterials and soft materials, you have kind of an entropic stiffness regime, for those of you who've, who've looked at polymer mechanics, where where you have a small strain stiffness that has to do with like unraveling thermal fluctuations. Uh, you can have yield due to the, the, the breakage of crosslinkers, which we will talk a little bit more about. And then a second regime that has to do with backbone stretching of polymers, for instance. Um, okay, so we can define two more parameters here. So this is the yield stress, is the stress at which these nonlinear effects kick in. Um, and, and typically, if, especially if you have this type of plateau, you would call that a yield stress. And then the strain at which that occurs is the yield strain. So those are two more characteristic properties of these types of systems. Um, and this yield transition typically corresponds to the onset of damage. And that damage is gonna dissipate energy, right? So now I continue to stretch the material, but as I continue to stretch the material, the stress that's developed doesn't increase, right? So even though I'm stretching, 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 
I don't see a huge increase in stress because the energy that's going into the system is being dissipated. And, and that dissipation is often happening through some sort of microscale damage. And, um, and in most cases, especially for synthetic materials, that damage accumulates and is not recovered. So that energy is lost to the system. So now we are leading to irreversible changes within the system. And if you stretch a material far enough that you get into this yield plateau, then when you, when you um, release the material and pull it again, on that second pull, you'll see that you have a very different material than you had initially because you've damaged it, right? Because you've moved into this yield regime where you've really damaged the system. Um, okay, so uh, the other thing we can look at is failure. So if I were to have a tensile sample, and you could see that like in that video I showed you, you have a tensile sample where you pull, 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 and eventually it breaks. That failure um, is, is a meaningful data point as well, right? And, and we have words that, core, that sort of describe that failure. So the maximum stress that's developed in your sample, which for many samples is the stress at failure, it's not always, but in many samples it's the stress at failure. This is units of strength. Sorry, this is called strength and it is units of stress. So, so often like, you know, I'll have students and especially students from, from maybe physics or chemistry backgrounds that come in and say, I want, I want a really stiff material. And I'll say, okay, well, what do you, like, what do you mean by stiff? And they're like, something that's really strong. So stiff and strong are not interchangeable words, right? So stiff has to do with that linear modulus piece and it has to do with how elastic the system is. Strong has to do with how much stress your material can withstand before it fails, right? So what's the maximum amount of stress that your material can withstand? They have the same units, unfortunately, and everything here kind of has the same units because strain is dimensionless. So your only unit really is, um, is stress. The maximum strain is often called the, the strain at failure. So, so these are two ways to define failure and to define strength. Um, the, other, the other measurable that we get is toughness. So toughness is the area under the curve and it's related to the dissipated energy. So here, um, it's often reported as energy per unit volume, and this is the energy per unit volume needed to fail the material. So how much energy do you need to put in to fail the system? So because this, because again, stress has units of, of newtons per meter squared and strain is dimensionless, the toughness will also have units of pressure effectively or modulus, um, but you shouldn't think of it that way. You should think of it as an energy density because it's the energy that has gone into having to, to failing this system. Resilience is another term you may hear sometimes, and at least for, for, for mechanical engineers, what resilience means is the amount of energy that's recoverable in the linear regime. So remember, like imagine that you're, you're doing an experiment and you're applying strains, you're applying a deformation and you can normalize that to strain. So as you move along this strain axis, you can, you can kind of you know, extend and, and stretch and extend and, and compress. And if you stay in this linear regime, then this should be completely reversible. That's the point of the elastic regime. And it's only when you move into the yield regime that you start to see um, energy which you cannot recover. So resilience specifies this recoverable energy and, and toughness specifies uh, all of the energy to failure. Okay, so if we think about kind of an ideal material and I think often about ideal materials for load bearing, like I'm interested in, in how materials can withstand stress and how they can, you know, how we can understand how muscles in our, in our, in our arms, for instance, um, are able to withstand large stresses, how bones are able to do this, how they fail in cases of disease. So, so if you want to think about load bearing, the main parameters that you would think about is like, how do I make a system stiff? So stiff would have this, um, a stiff material would have a high slope here. Right, so that means that at very small strains, I don't have to stretch it very much to be able to develop a very high stress. On the other hand, the other way to think about that is I would have to apply a very large stress in order to deform it even a little, right? So that's, that's what a stiff system is. If I want a system that's strong, then I wanna make sure that it develops to really high stresses before it fails. Typically stiff and strong come together because if you don't get that high slope to begin with, then you probably can't achieve really high stresses. So, so strong materials usually are also stiff, which is why in our common parlance, we, we connect those two words, but they mean different things. And then um, a, a material that can be stretched to very large strains would be called extensible. So, so that's a, a material that can be really stretched to a, a large distance is, is extensible. And, um, uh, and, and in the case that we have a material that is both strong and extensible, so we can develop high stresses and we can achieve high strains, then those materials tend to be very tough. 
and, and developing materials with toughness is really important for load bearing because uh, tough materials will typically with, be able to absorb a lot of energy, right? So, so that's really good for packaging. It's really good for any types of materials where you're interested in, um, in making sure that you can absorb load. So, so tissue replacements, for instance, cartilage replacements, contact lenses, you know, those sorts of things where you don't want to fail them. So, so Megan, two, yeah. two, minute, two minute warning. Perfect. Um, okay, so, uh, so just the last piece when you think about this sort of, you know, where does the energy go is um, we can use cyclic loading to try to describe some of this, right? So in this case, up until now, I've only been showing you the loading curves, but imagine that when I got to this point, imagine I stopped just before failure, right? So I didn't fail the system, but I stopped it sometime before failure, and then I reversed my crosshead and I looked at what, the, what forces were developed in unloading. So this is the loading curve and the unloading curve. So the energy between here tells me something, right? And, and, and there's a different type of toughness that's associated with, with that energy. Um, and and I, can, I can assess a little bit more about how this energy is dissipated in some of these damage mechanisms by looking at cyclic loading. So this would be what I would call like the first loading and unloading. And now I could imagine doing a second loading where I, I pull the sample again. And in most synthetic materials where the damage accumulated is not repaired, then the second loading would often follow the first unloading. So as I pull again, instead of following this original line that I followed, I'll follow the unloading curve. This isn't a general rule, but this is often true. Um, until I get to strains that I've never seen before. And then I have a pristine material at these strains. And then at that point, I'd probably pick up to where this initial part is. Again, this isn't, this isn't a hard rule, but this is typically true. And then if I unload, I follow a different curve, right? So, so in each of these cases, I have this effect where the, the, the second loading follows the first unloading until I get to the pristine material. And then in the pristine material, I basically follow the monotonic loading curve. Um, and the energy dissipated in these two systems is different because I, I've, already, I've already used up the energy basically in the first yield plateau. I don't get any more of that. Um, okay, so in terms of the microscopics, just briefly, and I'm gonna get more into this into the research talk, stiffness and strength are typically dictated by cross-linking. So in most soft materials, we're talking about polymers, right? The polymers might be proteins, so they might be some other type of polymer, but these polymers are able to entangle and they're able to um, uh, come close enough together that they can bear stress, but the strongest ones and the stiffest ones will have specific molecular interactions that bind them. And those interactions can either be covalent or they can be dynamic, but multivalent crosslinks where you have lots of pieces coming together are the, are the most effective. Dynamic bonds are particularly advantageous in some of these cases because they can break and unform and break and unform. And that leads to interesting reversibility, uh, which we see in biological materials often and, and is a really interesting way to achieve toughening. And, and again, I'll talk more about this in the research talk. Um, this can add time dependence, which I've sort of ignored in the tutorial up until now. So if you have if you have interest or questions in that, you should you should let me know. Um, one thing that the dynamic bonds allow you to do is to you know start with a material that says you know has a specific type of bonding structure and apply a strain so that you pull all of those polymers apart. And as you pull them apart, um, some of these bonds will break. Right, that's the yield. Yield transition says some of these bonds will start to break. But if they're dynamic, that means they can reform. So in this path at the top here, where I've only pulled it a little bit, when I reform, I probably reform the exact same bonds I had before. So this allows me to develop damage that can be healed. So this is the pathway that we talk about for self-healing materials. Biological materials are often like this. When we talk about self-healing materials, we're typically not talking about like actual regeneration like you would get in, in biological healing. You're talking about this sort of reversibility. At very large strains, you may not recover the initial state, but you'll recover a similar state, right? Because the bonds may be stretched so much from their initial position that they don't come back to the original position. Um, and then the, the last piece is that you can have microstructures that form. I, I warned you about lattice structures at the beginning, but lattice structures can be important and useful, um, and microstructure can be important because it can blunt cracks. And you saw that actually in this case, right? So we had these pores that were developed in the system, and that allowed for like a really interesting crack pattern to form that allowed for you know, much more extensibility than we would have had if it just clean cut across, right? And that clean cut across would have brittily failed the system and would have given us a lot less energy dissipation than we have here. One caveat is that the onset of fracture is often driven by defect 
and in that case can be stochastic. So the linear properties that we measure like modulus and onset of yield are typically much more robust than strength and toughness, which are often dictated, the failure is often dictated by a stochastic process. So in some cases you can notch to pre-defect, sort of give a pre-defect um, to provide a little bit more, uh, you know, better reproducibility in your samples. Okay, so um, I'm gonna, I'll just stop here actually and take some questions. This is just an idea of like some of the multi-scale systems that we have and some of the ideas of like how we can deal with design across these boards. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions at this point. Great, thanks Megan. Um, there is a, a question from Aravind Chandra Sakaran about the energy scales of dissipation um, and, and are there ways to think about how much energy is dissipated both in the elastic, where I think it's probably pretty low, and in the yield regime. Yeah. So, um, so in the in a, in a truly purely elastic regime, you wouldn't have energy dissipation, right? So, in a pure elastic system, you would expect that you would have um, you'd have all of your energy returned to you. Now, you can have linear viscoelastic materials where you have energy which is dissipated through viscous interactions with solution, um, which I've sort of ignored for the purpose of this tutorial, just because it gets into rheological characterization and I didn't think I could do a good job to cover it in 25 minutes. Um, but, but dissipation in general, you know, I think of energy dissipation as usually being about either um, either flow through viscous means, or in this case of solid materials through damage, right? So, so you have you have damage in crosslinks that are that are breaking, or features that are breaking within your system. And in some cases, like in those dynamic bonds, you can recover a portion of it, but it doesn't mean that it wasn't released in the first place. Like it was released in the first place. It's just that you can you can recover some of it in in the return. So. Without getting into very specifics, I think it's hard to answer that more generally. Um, I guess the scale, I guess the scale is set by, the scale set by the energy of the material, which I would argue, is, you know, sort of set by the, by the thermal energies, the cross-linking bonding schemes and the length scales. Um, so for time, let's just do one more brief question now. Benjamin Strain asked if um, materials that are highly extensible are considered very resilient. Um, resilience is a weird word. It's a great question. Resilience is a weird word. So, so resilience is often defined the way that I defined it on one of those slides where it's just looking at the linear piece. So then it wouldn't have much to do with extensibility, right? It would have to do with, I guess, the, 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 ex, the ex, it'd have to do with the yield strain. So if you had a, a large yield strain, which would mean a large linear regime, then you'd be very resilient. But even among engineers, we use the term resilience exactly as you've described, that if you have something that's really extensible, you would, you would also have something that is, that is resilient. And in that way, resilience is, is almost used the same way as toughness. But, um, but it's, it's an imprecise use of that term, I would say. Okay, let's let's stop here and start going on to the research talk. Um, for okay. questions that we that we didn't get to, um, people are invited to ask them in the informal discussion at the end of the next talk, or we'll also um, collect these questions from the chat and share them with Megan to maybe follow up by email. Yeah, Megan, do you yeah, want to go absolutely. ahead? Absolutely. Okay. All right. So now that you have a little bit of the jargon of mechanics under your belt. Um, we can think about how to apply that maybe to, to a system that at least I find interesting. I hope you find interesting. Um, and this is, uh, and I def define this as sort of reverse engineering nature, right? So, so looking at nature, looking at a really interesting system of nature, and then trying to figure out like what the heck's happening here and how can I maybe make materials that have a little bit of this, this feature. My design inspiration is going to be marine muscle. And this is something that I have become I'm particularly enamored with since I moved to Santa Barbara and we're close to the ocean and we have access to these beautiful materials. And I must say that when I moved here, I did not anticipate that the ocean would influence my research and it has absolutely influenced, you know, 90% of the research that I do now in terms of looking at marine organisms and also these marine systems. So, um, so here's a picture of mussels bound to a rock. It's these little bumpy things here that you might think are little rocks. They're not little rocks, they're mussels. 
and they have they have uh, attached in the intertidal zone, and they have to achieve this really robust adhesion and create strong materials that resist failure um, in order to maintain their attachment to rocks. And, and that's really important for their life cycle and it's really important for their, um, for their abilities to survive, to breed, to eat, to do all these things. Okay, I wanted to start with the acknowledgement slide because I, if I run late, I might stop it, you know, in the middle here and I don't wanna miss thanking everybody who is really important to, to this work. So, um, so these are their pictures. The people listed here have been really important to this work. I'll try to call them out as we go through. The funding for this comes from the National Science Foundation um, through the MERSEC program which supports the, the UC uh, Santa Barbara MRL. Okay, so, so I think that, so I just spent like a half an hour talking to you about general engineering materials, but I think biomaterials have really specific advantages that I would like to just highlight a little bit before we move forward, right? So, so one is that the materials have somehow evolved to perform. And, um, and I think that is, that's really an interesting and different process than we have for engineered materials. And in some ways it means that they are probably much better at doing certain things than an engineered material would be. It's biology's had a really long time to, to search out different potential solutions and find optima. I, I always have a caveat here when I say this, which is that like biology's optimal may not be your optimal. So, so choose your model system carefully, right? <laughs> because it's not clear that it's been optimized for exactly what you care about. But if you look and see uh, processes that cost the, the organisms a lot of energy, then, then you, it's a good bet that, that those systems are very optimized, right? So for instance, in mussels, attachment is an extremely expensive process for them. They use about 10% of their metabolic energy on something to do with attachment. So small increases in their ability to adhere lead to huge increases in their um, energy use right huge decreases in their energy so they have to eat less that means they can spend more time doing other things so um so they're a good model system for for this sort of thing the other piece of biological materials that are really interesting and i've been thinking about more and more in my career here is is what happens with processing like how do we make these materials and as i've moved from someone who has you know spent most of my time studying things that already exist to trying to spend time creating new materials through, through use of innovative materials, chemistry and, and materials design, you know, I really become fascinated with how good biology is at doing this sort of processing. And some of the features that biosystems typically have that, that engineered systems are terrible at are, are out of equilibrium processes, time-gated and spatially controlled production of precursors and reactions. So, so biological systems are excellent at being able to create micro-reactor systems or, or spatially heterogeneous, temporally heterogeneous systems to control when and where products are made. And, and that was really the, the driving feature behind some of that multi-material 3D printing that I talked about, which I don't have time to talk too much about today, but I can answer questions if you're interested. There's a huge diversity in precursor materials. There's a huge diversity in chemical reaction pathways. There are often property gradients, which makes analysis of mechanics challenging, as we discussed in the tutorial. Um, and the materials are constantly being repaired. And in this case, I'm not just talking about dynamic bonds, which, which can reform, but actual repair, right? Where new materials being generated and manufactured on the fly. So these are things that we are really just beginning to touch on from, a, from an engineering perspective, but are just like, absolute hallmark intrinsic features of biological materials. And then the other is that in biosystems, these weak interactions are really important. So weak interactions are these non-covalent interactions. These are the dynamic bonds I talked about in the tutorial. So, so these allow for transient networks to form. They often allow for cooperative effects. These sorts of bonds can be sensitive to pH or hydration or ionic conditions, and that can allow for really interesting reconfiguration and stimuli responsivity, right? So, so for example, here is a, a, a polymer system that I'm borrowing from Niels Holton Anderson's group. Uh, he's at MIT now. And the, um, the, the polymer that forms here forms through the ability of metal ions to bond onto a, a structure here called a catechol, which is actually muscle inspired. And you can form either a, a, a two way crosslink, which is called a bis crosslink, or a three way crosslink, which is a tris crosslink. This is pH dependent. And in this way, depending upon the pH, you can mix together these polymers plus metal salts and create solid hydrogels. Right? So, so these hydrogels have properties then which are dictated by the underlying 
chemistries and are really dependent upon dynamic bonds. And, and that dynamicity is, is a really interesting way to, to program material behavior. Okay, so we come back here to the design of these muscle-inspired systems. So muscles create some sort of glue that lets them stick to rocks, right? That's, that's basically the idea. And, and Santa Barbara is a great place to study it. We're pitched right on the edge of the ocean. We have lots of muscles everywhere. So this is a real area of, of, uh, of strength and fun and, and you know, a lot of effort here, um, here on the California coast. So I think the way that muscles make these adhesives is absolutely amazing, right? It is the only example that I know of, of uh, biological injection molding. So you have precursor materials that live within the muscle body, and these are, these are uh, admixtures of positively and negatively formed uh, uh, charged polymers. So you have positive polymers and negative polymers that are pre-manufactured and held in the muscle body. And then at some point, it takes this organ, which you can see here, it's this like black thing that sticks out. It's called a foot because it uses it to move around. But the closest human analog would be our tongue, right? So it's like a strong muscular organ, doesn't have bones, and can change shape. And in fact, it can roll up the way some of us can roll our tongues, roll up and create a tube. It presses against a surface, and then the polymers are injected down that tube and, and, and are held against the surface. They rapidly cure, the, the foot releases itself, and when it leaves and less behind, it leaves behind this sticky pad. So this pad has bound to the surface, it has a, a disc at the bottom, which we call the plaque, it has a long thread, which attaches it back to the muscle body, and then this foot moves and makes another one, and it creates a radial array around the body. These are typically like one-use structures, so they're not repaired, but they, but they do have some resilience properties. Okay, so um, I'm interested in the, in the mechanical properties of these, right? So if we look at the muscle, they have this, this uh, array of threads around them called the byssus. If we look at a, a, a structure a little bit more closely, you can see that disc at the bottom and the thread, which is coming back and attaching onto the muscle body. If we take a cross section through this and look through electron microscopy, you can see this hard outer shell, which acts probably like a backing, the way that the the way that the non-sticky piece of plastic on your scotch tape acts like a backing, right? It creates some sort of like mechanical feature here on the outside. You have a porous structure inside. There are collagen fibers which infiltrate into this porous material. Um, and all together, they form this really stiff and strong material that, uh, that enhances adhesion and, and allows for, for muscles to stick. So when my group came onto the, um, the, the stage for this, now like six or seven years ago, we were really surprised with the lack of um, physical testing and mechanical testing in the system. There was a huge amount known about the protein chemistry and about the overall like composition of these systems from a biochemical perspective, but people, had, people knew that these structures exist, but they had very little understanding of like what was happening from a mechanical perspective. So we decided we wanted to understand like why were these so so strong? Why were these so tough? Like why were they so good at um, at being able to bear loads and and deal with this adhesion? So to understand a little bit about the structure, I want to just go briefly into the chemistry. And I'll say that there there's not a huge um, agreement here on exactly what's happening because all of this chemistry is happening like under the foot. So the foot goes down. All of these polymers are are squeezed out through an injection molding, they're cured eventually, but there's a bunch of chemistry that's happening under the foot. So some of it we know because we know the proteins that are involved, some of it we know because we take those proteins and we look at them in test tubes or we look at them in in vitro systems and we make um, reasonable guesses about what's happening. But in detail, it's very challenging to study this initial processing step. But we think what's happening is the foot comes down, the muscle creates a little bit of a negative pressure, that negative pressure helps release the proteins and polymers into uh, the cavity, which will form the plaque. Um, there's a pH adjustment under the plaque, which drops the pH under the foot to about pH of three. So seawater's pH eight, but there's a, a pH adjustment here that drops this down and creates an environment which is really nice for, um, for redox adjustment and for, for deposition of these proteins. So there's, this, is, this is where this microstructural control of local environment becomes really important. The proteins are then secreted. These again are these like poly basically polymer chains that are either positively or negatively charged. They form a liquid-liquid phase separated 
suspension, which is called a coacervate. So the, the negative charge and, poly and, and positively charged polymers like to aggregate. This is mainly driven by the expulsion of the counter ions. So it's an entropically driven effect, which leads to the formation of these liquid drops. Um, and these liquid drops have the advantage of a very low surface tension, so they can wet the surface really easily. As the concentration increases, we believe there's a phase inversion. So now instead of having polymer-rich drops in a polymer dilute phase, you have a continuous phase that's polymer-rich with polymer-poor droplets inside, right? That's what I mean by phase inversion. Um, eventually, the assembly is completed. The cuticle comes down at some point in this process. The foot releases, and when it does, there's an infusion of seawater. That increase in pH leads to, um, leads to cross-linking and perhaps also leads to um, some formation of these phase separation. So the exact order of these events, although I've described them here, and, and my collaborator Herb Wade has described this beautifully in this review article, uh, is really not so well known. And in particular, like exactly when the solidification occurs with respect to the phase separation is not so well known, right? It could be that the solidification is occurring at the same time or even before some of the phase separation. Here's some of the chemistry that's involved. You often hear DOPA as being a, a, a really important adhesive molecule. Uh, it's derived from lots of molecules, but, but, but muscles specifically. It, it has this nice structure where you have these two hydroxyl groups coming down, and that allows this molecule to interact with a, a large number of different surfaces. It can participate in hydrogen bonding and metal ion coordinated bonding. It allows these polymers to be permissive to many different types of substrates. Realize like mussels can't choose their substrate, and they are able to bind to lots of different things in the oceans, um, including ships and rocks and each other, right? So, so this type of permissive chemistry for cross-linking is, is really helpful in that regard. So eventually this type of porous structure forms. So here's an electron micrograph and if we look very carefully here you can actually see like you know this beautiful lattice structure inside the pore, um, large pores which are about two microns but also fine network structure which is you know hundreds of nanometers and in, even network structures that can exist within these pores. So the the speculation is that what we see here is the remnants of uh, of the liquid-liquid phase separation and the cross-linking that has occurred afterwards, right? Although creating direct relationships between the processing and the mechanics remains a, a, a challenge in this field. We've used both electron microscopy and, um, and small angle neutral scattering to be able to get at these length scales. You know, th there's lots of reasons that we use both of those techniques, including trying to make sure that fixatives weren't an issue and that we were able to get under very different sample preparations, very similar types of length scales. And this has been published and we can we can talk about it if you want. But um, but the main idea is that there's a nanostructure and then there's this micropore structure that forms. We've recently started to look at the kinetics of this, which is super difficult experiments, um, heroic experiments, some might say, led mainly by Justin Bernstein in my group, who's a, an undergrad who's, who's recently graduated. Um, and what he did, uh, working with Emma Filippiti, was looking at muscles that were bound to uh, these plastic sheets. So these are tanks where we have muscles that are harvested off our coast by divers that are uh, employed by the university to come back. Um, the muscles are placed in these tanks. They're equilibrated in seawater, which is plumbed into the building. So we have really exceptional facilities at Santa Barbara for this sort of work. They're, they're bound by rubber bands onto the system and they eventually make plaques, right? If you kind of hold them here close enough. Justin, meanwhile, is very close by watching them surreptitiously so that when they do make the plaque, and he can't disturb them because they're a little fussy, when they do make the plaque, he can go in and harvest it almost immediately, right? So, so that structure of being able to go in, harvest the plaque, and then, and then remove it uh, for analysis allows us to look somewhat at the kinetics of, uh, of, of formation. And he uses the same sort of fixation protocols that gave those beautiful images before, which, which Emma had, um, had really uh, optimized when she was working in my group. So, Here's what we see at pH 7.8. This is this is seawater pH. At 24 hours, we see this porous structure as we would expect. Um, and in fact, that porous structure forms almost immediately. So if we look at 15 minutes, we see the same sort of porous structure that forms. So there is some coarsening and the mechanics change a little bit over that time scale, but um, but we immediately see uh, we see this this sort of um, this sort of porous microstructure form. On the other hand, if we keep it at the deposition pH, pH 3, we don't see those pores form at all. So we see uh, a very, 
weak kind of texture here, but no porous formation. These plaques are extremely weak. We can't mechanically test them because they're so weak that we can't clamp them, right? Remember I talked about how clamping was such a challenge. They just fall apart. So, so this suggests that both the phase separation and the cross-linking rely on that infusion of, of seawater pH and, and that that processing is really important to developing the mechanics. Okay, so the way that we measure the mechanics is by building custom, cust uh, custom test frames to be able to apply displacements and measure forces. So we've built a small scale mechanical testing device like the one that I showed you um, in the tutorial, but tiny so that we can clamp tiny threads and uh, we have a visualization system so that we can observe the plaque either both from the side and from the underneath. So we can observe the ad adhered interface and we can also observe it from the side. Plaques do not normally have these stripes. This is just a little bit of nail polish that we put on so that we can measure um, you know, how, how these systems move and whether there's gradients in the, in the deformation. Um, we can change the pull angle and we can change the motor speed. And, and we've done a lot of studies on this. I'm only gonna show you a fraction of them, but um, but again, if you if there are questions about how we set this up, I, I'd be happy to answer them. This is the type of curve that we get. So we see that linear regime that we've talked about before, this elastic regime tipping over to a yield, although it's not really a plateau, right? But we do see sort of the onset of a um, of a different nonlinear effect, and eventually we get to a failure point and it drops down. You'll note here that despite everything I said in the first part of of this seminar. I've described this in force versus displacement uh, rather than stress versus strain. And that's because these things are just so oddly shaped that we don't quite know how to do the normalization to get us to, to stress and strain. So we tend to use force and displacement because I think it's just a little bit more honest uh, to show you the, the raw data in this way rather than to try to force a normalization that, that is a little unclear. Um, but if we look at the side view of what's happening, uh, you start to see that as we're pulling on the edge of this thread, you get this, um, uh, this deformation, which occurs mainly at the interface between the thread and the plaque. So at this junction here, gets really stretched out and eventually uh, an opening opens up under the, under the thread, basically at the cover slip surface, where you get a crack that opens here and then begins to propagate outward. And as that crack propagates outward, we can see it at the bottom here that I've circled it in the, in the red lines. Eventually that crack will, um, will thin out the plaque and, and will fail the plaque. So eventually we'll pull the plaque off in this case. Uh, it's not the only way that we can fail. We can also get what's called cohesive failure. So instead of failing at the interface, we fail within the plaque body. Uh, and we can also get a, peel and, uh, a crack and peel type of, of failure where a crack starts from the outside, comes down and hit, runs across the surface. And the proportion of, of events that we have in each of these categories depends upon the angle of pulling. So if we pull at like moderate acute angles, which is the physiological condition generally, we see this loss of adhesion. But if we pull at very shallow angles, we can get um, cohesive failure. And if we pull at obtuse angles, we can get this crack and peel, presumably because this structure has not been optimized for that loading condition, right? The, the, it's, it would be very strange for the, for the plaque to be kind of pulled opposite because of the way they're radially distributed around the, the plaque body. Um, and if we were in person, there would be some interpretive dance involved in my part to try to show you this more cleanly. But on Zoom, it's a little it's a little harder to do. So the peeling is really cool. And when we saw that the peeling could occur, we recognized that we would be able to exploit this to um, to measure some more of the fracture properties of the system. And in this case, what we've done is we've taken the plaque, and this was done by Ken Desmond when he was a postdoc in my group, um, and cut this into strips. So it has uniform thickness. And then he, he uses a razor blade to initiate a crack under the edge. And then he pulls. And as he pulls, he sees this increase in force. And then at some point, he sees that the force doesn't increase anymore. And during that time, you get peeling of this strip, right? So this is a very common uh, test that people use for tapes, right? If you wanted to measure the adhesion of, a, of like a scotch tape or something, a pressure sensitive adhesive. And he can measure the, the, the motion of this crack as it moves across the surface. And if he plots, the critical force that's required to advance the crack, which is this force here, and he normalizes it by the strip width and plots it against the angle in this way, then the slope of this line gives you a measure of the fracture energy. So the fracture energy is a, a sort of a special kind of toughness, right? That has to do with like the type of energy that's required to separate these two surfaces. So we're able to measure this, it's 100 joules per meter squared and it's, um, which is pretty reasonable, like it's a pretty reasonable tape uh, value. It is exceedingly higher than what you get in terms of the molecular interactions. So, so people have often looked at 
adhesion in muscles and they say, well, it's very adhesive because the proteins are so adhesive, right? But this is like four orders of magnitude higher than the individual protein level. Of course it is because you're building up that whole structure and you can dissipate energy across the whole structure. But, but when we reported this, this was really a bit of a surprise, especially to the people who were thinking about it from a biochemical perspective. And it really demonstrates that the design of the material is essential to being able to, to deal with energy dissipation across the volume. Um, okay, so we use the same system to look at microstructural failure uh, changes in failure. So these are these cyclic loading tests that we've talked about before. So you can load here in the elastic regime. This is near elastic. You can see it's just tipped over to yield. So we get a little bit of a hysteresis loop here. And then we get a second response and a third response. Um, and then eventually we pull to failure. Uh, if we were to just take the tops of these unloading of these loading curves, that would be the monotonic pull to failure. Right. So that's this idea that like every time you pull into a pristine area, you recover the monotonic loading behavior. But you can see here, it's, it's probably easiest to see between two and three. The unloading for two follows this kind of like greenish line. And then the loading for three is the yellow and they're not the same. And that suggests that there's some amount of recovery, even in the yield regime that there's some amount of energy which bounces back. And that energy which bounces back allows us to develop some stress here, which is beyond what we would have in the, in the lower case. This, it, it, for the plaque, this is not time dependent. So if we wait a longer time, we don't get this. And we did a lot of studies on that and we can, we can go through it. But, um, but this suggests an immediate recovery of some energy and, and perhaps suggests that like buckling or other types of, of topological changes are, are driving this rather than, rather than bond reformation. If we look with electron microscopy at samples that have been strained into that yield plateau, right? So if we get to two times the yield strain, effectively the yield displacement, remember we work in displacement, not in strain, but two times the yield displacement, then we can see significant damage accumulate across the plaque, right? So this porous structure now has, has massive holes which have opened up within it. These, these holes have caused um, scission of collagen, so collagen to break apart along the polymer chain. It's also caused fracture of these pore walls, right? So, so this is this is why we get yield because this is the microstructural damage which has occurred during yield. And again, some of it has some of it's recovered, but obviously most of it is not. The collagen scission is not recovered at this point. Megan, uh, look at what's sorry, that? Sorry, make it make a two-minute warning. Okay, so we can also look at what's happening here with the uh, development of um, uh, of damage within the cuticle, which is that outer piece. And we can see again that we can load and, and thin this to, um, to damage, right? So, so, and it's possible that this failure of the cuticle, the failure of the backing, which happens at like four times the yield plateau is, um, is responsible for the ultimate failure of the system. So we get a lot of damage within the pores to begin with, but it's actually the cuticle cracking, which, which causes the, the increased failure. So, so we've mainly looked at these physical mechanisms of adhesive performance. We have, to some extent, also looked at the chemical versions. So, so muscle adhesion, in terms of the biochemistry, is very well known. The adhesive proteins that are, that are identified here have stimulated development of, um, of surgical glues and all sorts, it's a real, like, all sorts of, of applications, and it's a real like, winner in terms of bio-inspired chemistries. So we've also looked a little bit at this, so just as to give you a, a, a very quick overview of some of the synthetic work that we've done here just in the last minute. Um, we have been able to capture this same sort of dopamine chemistry in synthetic systems. And I showed you at the beginning like some work that was done from Niels Holt and Anderson group looking at hydrogels. We, hydrogels are mostly water. They're not very strong. We wondered if we could do it in a load-bearing structural material. So um, in this work uh, led by Emma Filippidi and, and Tom Christiani that we published a few years ago, uh, we were able to look at an elastomer system and, and introduce these types of, of bonds into a very stiff polymer system. Um, this is the underlying chemistry. So we used a, um, an epoxide peg system and we were able to put in these muscle inspired crosslinkers as well as a small number of covalent crosslinkers. Again, this has been published, so I won't go through all of the details, but um, we can look at the sample when it's protected, this chemistry is very reactive. So we have a protective chemistry here that prevents cross-linking. We can swell the system and allow for hydrogen bonding. And then we can introduce iron and allow for a metal ion coordinated bonding. So this is this multivalent dynamic bonding. And, and we have a whole, the, the processing of this is somewhat challenging and we have a whole um, protocol in place to allow us to do this. 
But if we look at the protected and too protected so, cases, we don't see very much difference. So, um, Megan, so Megan we're, at, we're at time, so can you go ahead and wrap up? Yeah, but, and I'll end here. But if we have the stress versus strain, we see this really high increase in, in stiffness due to the metal ion coordinated bonding um, that does not compromise the extensibility because of the dynamic bonds. So this has allowed us to get a system that is stiff and strong and tough through, through the application of this sort of muscle inspired chemistry. And I will stop there. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Sure. Um, let's do let's do a couple questions. Um, so um, so Aravin Chandrasekharan asked about um, in the muscles that are in the sea whether the plaque remains sterile or do um, microbes colonize it? Like are there biofilms that go in those pores? Is yeah. much you known about that? Yeah, that's a super interesting question. So um, I don't so. I think there are microbes everywhere. I don't think anything in the sea is sterile. So I think that our idea of like swimming in pristine ocean water is not the right idea. So I think ocean water is pretty gross, right? So, so I think there's microbes everywhere. Um, I haven't seen too many studies of like microbes within plaques, but there is a question of like when the plaque comes down and makes that first contact, um, is there a biofilm that it needs to displace from the surface, right? And like, is there an antimicrobial piece to that. And people have studied that. And it seems like, you know, there's hints to the answer is yes, that there is some sort of antimicrobial um, uh, property at that initial formulation where, where the plaque can kind of displace a, a biofilm before coming in and, 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 and coming down. But yeah, I think, I think you're out of luck with sterility in the ocean. I'm sorry. Thanks. So, so um, Avery Eagles asked if it's known how the muscles disengage from the plaque footing when they decide it's time to move. Yeah, that's a great question. So I said that these are put down as like one-time use, right? So, so they're not released from the adhesive structure at the rock, but muscles do have a way to like cut the threads at their body. So they have a way to like release the threads at their body and they do that in a fright response. So, so if they're threatened in some way, um, or the environment has just gotten really fouled, like they're in a place where there's like some contamination or there's not enough food, they can just like basically like cut all their lines and drift away. It's risky for them because they might not find another suitable location to bond, right? So they only do this under the worst circumstances. In the labs, if, we, if, we, if you handle them roughly or if, uh, or if they get really perturbed, then they will also do this, right? So they just release the whole business at once. Okay. Um, great, so Josh Shavitz, um asked about sort of passive versus active materials. So, so you've mostly talked about just materials that are passive once they're formed. Um, uh, but we can also think about active ones where there's internal energy dissipation. And, and I think the core question is whether there's kind of a coherent framework for thinking about material properties of these or are the details too important or varied? I would, so I would say that in simple, in simple, soft, like complex fluids, like the viscoelastic kind of fluids, um, there is the development of a framework to work on this, right? So, so there are ways to think about how to use non-equilibrium statistical mechanics and to incorporate the appropriate um, energy energies to do this, right? And and that's often driven by um, by cytoskeletal networks where you have motor proteins where you specifically know the kinetics of of the energy which is going in, right? Um, of course, there are lots of other systems, bacterial systems, and I'm sure systems lots of people on this call study in, in much more detail than me. Um, I would say that on the mechanic side, like on the solid mechanic side, not so much, right? So on the solid mechanic side, there's not really a framework that gets into this. And, um, and I think it's in part because when you, when you have these solid systems, the energies that go in from molecular motors and some of these other like biological systems are too small. To, to make big changes to the, um, to the mechanical properties that we measure. So um, yeah, so I don't think that framework has really developed on the solid mechanics side. I think it's more on the rheology side, which would be for the softer system. So there's an opportunity there. My group's been looking at um, light activated chemistries and, and, and stimuli responsive systems to light. And, and I think there's, there's, there's ways for us to think about that in the framework of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, but um, but it hasn't, it, yeah, it hasn't been connected yet. 
Okay, I think we'll stop there with the with the formal discussion. So thanks to Megan for giving two excellent talks. Um, and I should also mention that we want to thank um, Olivia Leland, who's uh, live tweeting the talks mm. today. She's a graduate student at Brandeis. So thanks That's for that. Exciting. Yeah, exactly. I don't think I've never been live tweeted before. <laughs> uh, well, okay, here you go. Uh, Olivia's doing Olivia's doing that today.